Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. When a child has been abandoned by his or her parents, it leaves a wound that is hard to overcome. And those nearby may feel there's nothing they can do. Today we'll be talking with someone who has spent most of his childhood living in an orphanage, and he has some great ideas for us. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Rob Mitchell, author of Castaway Kid, One Man's Search for Hope and Home, which is his story of growing up in an orphanage. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, it's great to be here. You were left at an orphanage at age three without warning. Yes. Uh, my father abandoned my mother and I in Chicago, put a gun to his head, pulled the trigger and blew out part of his brains. But he didn't kill himself and for the next 26 years was a walking vegetable in a hospital in uh, Georgia. So no father, uh, completely incapacitated. Yes. And what about your mom? My mother had enormous emotional and psychological problems that she had masked, but as always in marriage those masks come down. And three months after my father's failed suicide attempt, she drugged me by train from Chicago, Illinois to Princeton, Illinois and abandoned me without a word of explanation. There you are in that home, you're holding her hand, she turns and walks away. What, can you remember what you were thinking at the time? You know, three-year-olds aren't supposed to remember much. No. But I've learned that kids in crisis, we either block it out, never remember, or we never forget. She had commanded me to sit on a floor and play with a strange boy with blocks and I reached for a block and he stole it. And I reached for a block and he stole it. And I turned to my mother for help and she was gone. Wow, just like that. Just like that. What was it like to be in the boy's home? How many, how many young other boys were there? What was that day-to-day -day experience for you? There were 60 kids at any given day, plus staff. We were broken into four groups, little boys, little girls, big boys, big girls. Uh, the Number one adjective, and I spent 14 years there from age 3 to 17, would be disciplined, regimented. Nothing happened until the bell rang. Okay, so they had order, yes. and that probably helped them really manage that large a number of children. Yes. Mm -hmm. The bell would ring at 7, we'd get out of bed, put our clothes on, uh, go down to breakfast 7.30, lunch is noon, cookies and juice after school, supper's 5.30, and then they locked the kitchen. They weren't being mean but there was no staff and money to set out snacks and clean it up. So if you were hungry at eight o'clock at night, tough. Go to the bathroom, drink tap water. When you were on that little boy's floor, you had a wonderful house mother mm -hmm. and her name was Nola. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Nola and what was meaningful in her interactions with you. Nola came a couple years after I did. She was a Northern Minnesota farm girl at Bible College when God called her to work with kids like us. She was quick to laugh, quick to hug, and quick to spank. Okay. <laughs> and I got all three. <laughs> um, but that was actually what a family would do. Exactly, exactly. And there's photographs in Castaway Kid of 12 little boys. Uh, Nola, on any given day, had 10 to 16 little boys, 24 hours a day, five and a half days a week, by herself. Wow, think about the patience that she would need, mm -hmm. the sort of, uh, ability to keep things under wrap, but also discipline was probably yes. very important to her. Right. When you were little before you went to school, you got to follow her around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was important for the resilience you've had all through your life? Yeah, I think it was. Um, I, I had some time by myself because all the other boys were in school and I was actually not supposed to be let in. I was too young. Um, and so I would do little chores or carry a laundry bag to laundry building or whatever. Uh, so it helped me connect to Nola perhaps a little bit more than the boys who came and went daily. You had a grandmother, Gigi, who mm -hmm. was very, very important in your life. Yes. Why wasn't she able to adopt you? Gigi worked at the great department store, Marshall Fields. Yes. She lived in a two-room apartment in North Chicago. She saw herself as too old and poor to raise me. Uh, that's probably not fair because there's a bunch of grandmothers who raise their grandchildren on potato sa sandwiches, but... I think the honest truth as I got older is that Gigi didn't have the psychological and emotional strength to deal with my mother. I was my mother's only child. She was Gigi's only child. 
And as chaotic as my mother was, if Gigi had me, my mother, when she was loose on the streets, would just give her grief. And I don't think Gigi felt strong enough to fight my mother. So actually the boys' home was, in Gigi's mind, perhaps safer yes. and had more structure. And right. she thought that you would actually, even though it wasn't living with a family member, was probably in your best interest. Yes. But she would take the train and get mm. up and take a long journey mm -hmm. to see you regularly. Yes. Every Saturday, my mother hid me from her for months because people like my mother are engaged in their own internal weird power games that make no sense to anybody but them. But once Gigi found where I was, she would walk um, four blocks to Howard Street, the bus to the Howard Street L, the L downtown, uh, the California Zephyr from the Union Station, get to Princeton, then it was five blocks to the children's home. And she did that every Saturday. And she'd arrive around 10 or 10.30 and then have to leave about 2.30 or 3. And for her, it was a good 16 to 18 hour day. Wow. Now this was unusual for a boy to have a regular visitor yes. like that? Yes, very few of the, the 60 kids uh, had a positive regular family member interacting in their life. Your mom also came at one point unexpectedly mm -hmm. yes. and just took you out of the home. Yes, my mother was in and out um, periodically, very chaotic, uh, but in um, 1962, she inherited $10,000. Her, her father, who she was estranged from, died in an accident. She got insurance policy. That doesn't sound like a lot today, but in 1962, that was almost four years of income for most people. Right. And she came and kidnapped me, and we scurried around Chicago for several months before the authorities found us. Uh, she blew all the money in about three weeks. And we were living in a rat hole off of uh, Foster Avenue. Uh, I ended up in the Audi home, which is boys' prison, because nobody knew who quite owned me then. Um, and that's when she lost legal custody and was locked down in psychiatric ward for a number of years. So up until that time, that your status, your legal status, was not as clear. So she could come exactly. and take you from the home because she still had parental rights. Exactly. But after this episode, her parental rights were terminated. Right. And so you were made a ward of the state? Actually, no. Uh, one of the strange elements of my story is that my father's family was wealthy down in Atlanta. Uh, they owned Mitchell Motors, Oldsmobile Rolls-Royce, Tom Mitchell Buick, mansion servants, country clubs. And they got legal custody of me, but they chose not to raise me. You have another grandmother in this story, mm -hmm. Pauline. Yes. And that is your father's mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was not willing to let that family adopt you. Correct. And obviously we might view on that, differ on that issue, but the reality is that she would tell me over and over again, she was so happy I was living with all these wonderful playmates and nannies. So she just recreated what your experience was. Exactly. Playmates and nannies. Playmates and nannies. Which is far from your experience. You know, one of the things that's amazing about the human mind is the disconnect it can do with reality. I was at a book signing at Barnes & Noble a couple years ago and two men who, they, and they told me they were 89 and eight, 90 came up and they said, were your father's first cousins. Really? My son-in-law was helping me and I kind of steeled up a little bit inside, expecting to be prepared for them to say, you know, I think he exaggerated a little. About Pauline? About the whole, whole thing, thing, the Mitchell family not taking me. And instead what they said was, you know, boy, we all knew about you, but nobody would talk about you. All right, so we're really talking about the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. The discussion about mental health was not as prominent. Right. People were ashamed, mm -hmm. and this kind of story was an embarrassment, and perhaps to your prominent family, right. at least Pauline thought it was mm -hmm. even more of an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. But did you really buy the story that Pauline would have that much say over all these aunts and uncles, or did you think it was more complicated than that? I honestly didn't know until um, I was, the, the fall of the year I turned 20, I went on a mission trip to Africa, and my great uncle Arnold, I finally asked the question out loud, nobody, I hadn't had the courage to ask, right, right. why did nobody take me? Right. Here you are yeah. in college. Right. So you're really psychologically more able to withstand exactly. whatever answer whatever was going to be. Did he feel any remorse or embarrassment, sadness? Did, did your yeah. family ever explain it? He did. When I finally asked it, he did. He cried. It's the only time I ever saw him cry. Right. Um, 
but yet, you know, I could be angry and bitter, but I understand many families have a certain dynamic that if, if it's inconvenient or if it's uncomfortable, we're just not going to talk about it. Right, and they did have you down in the summer. Right, they would fly me down. Once my mother lost custody, they'd fly me to Atlanta, and for two weeks it was like Disney World, and they'd fly me back to the children's home every summer. Oh, so on the one hand, I mean, just hearing this, this parting, so you have to go back to the children's home when you know you have this other home. Mm -hmm. How did that play a, a favorably for you in some ways, knowing that you had this family, and how did it play out negatively for you? That's a great question. I think the um, favorable was it gave me a glimpse of another lifestyle. Mm. It's one of the challenges, speaking here to uh, boys in prison as well as male sex, young male sex offenders, the hardest thing for at-risk kids is to get a vision they can be something else. Their identity exactly. is not this abandoned person. Right. But they can imagine a life that exactly. is more normal and even successful. Exactly. And not, not just successful because you sell drugs. Right, right. Okay. Right. So you saw a family that had businesses. Had business success, right, right. financial success. And so part of me on the positive side says, I can do that too. Right. And you were a hard worker. Yes. Tell about the cement story. <laughs> oh, well, I thought money would save me, and I started looking for a job when I was 12. And I've, I've not been tall, but I've always been a pretty big, strong kid for my age. And nobody would hire kids like us. They really didn't want boys from the home. And I went to a lumber yard, and I just said, you give me the worst job in the world, and if I do it, you give me a job. And this old geezer said, well, we got a pallet of cement, or a boxcar of cement, and you move the bags from the pallet into the storage room. And I calculated later how many thousands of pounds of concrete my little 12-year-old body carried, but I did it. I thought it'd break me. The muscles in my ears were in pain. I was in such pain. And he grinned and said, boy, you done earned your job. <laughs> That's right. And so right then at age 12, you started working yes. and earning money. Yes. And that actually set you apart too because it gave you some idea of a future. Exactly. Exactly. By the time I was 16, in 1970, I'd save $3,000. Which, again, was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. You could have bought a brand new Ford Mustang. <laughs> Did that. you think about that? A little bit, but, but I knew that in watching the boys go ahead of me that we, we really didn't know cash flow management things, how to balance a checkbook, how to hold a job. There were just a lot of life issues at that time that the, the system wasn't teaching us. That's not a criticism. It's a statement. Right. You had a number of people who functioned as mentors yes. for you. What did they do right uh, and what did they do wrong? I'm absolutely persuaded that love is a four-letter word spelled T-I-M-E. Ah, -E. time. Kids like us don't care how much you know. You can come in a PhD in child education. Right. We don't give a flying flip. Right. We want to see if you'll keep showing up. And there were people who kept showing up. They kept showing up. Ordinary men, and, and I know they were doing something for the girls, but I don't, it's right. not in my consciousness. Right. Um, but I'm not impressed with celebrities who show up as photo opportunities. But a guy named Jim who taught me to lift weights and ham radio. A yeah. guy named Bob who taught me to hunt that was yeah. impactful for me. Um, a guy named Swanee taught me whitewater and, and wilderness. And because of Swanee, I got the vision I could do this. And I've done the Boundary Waters because of Swanee and many of the American uh, mountain ranges and white water, Swiss and German Alps, uh, lived in the jungles of the Congo, drove a pickup truck 2,500 miles across Africa because a, a guy took the time to show me I could. They actually treated you lovingly and oh, like yes. a human. Yes. Right? Not like the people who said, you're one of those boys from that no. boy's home. We can't trust you. You're no good. They actually said, you're worth investing in. Yes. Yes, and I, I have nothing but praise for the staff of the Children's Home. But what they can't do is they can't get into the anger and loneliness and confusion right. of a child who's been abandoned. You, you can surround me with caring adults, but as an at-risk kid, I still have these issues. And when I spoke to the juvenile boy sex offenders, I asked the question. I said, how many of you live in 24-hour rage what they and say? are exhausted by it? Right. And every hand went up. This is what you know. So you come in looking like a successful businessman. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know about my rage? Mm -hmm. And you're here having come on the other side? Yes. How do you get by that rage? It doesn't just go away. No, the first step for me 
was the fall of my senior year in high school, uh, I honestly re-examined the promises of Jesus and, and asked Jesus to come and change my life. It was a moment that I know something happened. Okay. But it was process. I did not clean up overnight. Um, I still drank a lot and, and, and did marijuana for a number of years. You know, it, it's process. But I also then started letting adults who wanted to help me help me. And that's another challenge because there are many adults who really care, but kids like us don't know how to open the door of our heart to let them in because we're afraid to trust. Well, why trust? That's right. Why trust? Um, going to Africa was the third most profound thing. Living in the jungles of Congo, meeting tribesmen who had no electricity and, and had a spiritual depth I'd really never experienced. And realizing that God is not just the God of blonde-haired, blue-eyed, English-speaking Americans, white-skinned Americans, but God's truly the God of the universe. I went to the Congo, an uncertain boy of the, from an orphanage. I came out a certain son of God. Wow. And then the fourth thing is that God called me two years later in college to forgive. And I fought it. I said, I don't want to, and I can't do it. It's too painful. But I found God to be terribly inconvenient. Patiently waiting, zealously pursuing. I had three people I needed to forgive. My father never touched my life. I have no conscious memories of him. But I had to forgive his suicide because suicide is abandonment. My father abandoned me. And changed your life forever. Exactly, negatively. Right. Set off a very negative chain of events. His mother, my grandmother, Mitchell, I had to forgive for her apathy. So Pauline, who was just unwilling to step out of her right. embarrassment. Right. And step up to the plate and do what was right by her grandson. And apathy is its own kind of abuse. It is. Because I, you yeah. had needs and mm -hmm. she could just sit on her hands and pretend it wasn't right. there. So I had to forgive her of her apathy. My mother was the chaos. My mother wounded me over and over and over again. Um, there are no good memories in my life of my mother. She actually died on what was the third date with the woman who's now my wife. Um, and as bad as it sounds, it was a relief. I had forgiven her, but I remember fighting God on this call because I said, look, Grandmother Mitchell's dead. My father's a vegetable in a mental hospital in Georgia. My mother's chaotic. She's on the street somewhere. They're not going to know they're forgiven. What difference does it make? What difference did it make? Forgiving didn't free them. Forgiving freed me. Right. It freed me of the anger and the bitterness and the loneliness and the hopelessness and the rage to become the man God imagined I could be, not the man my past said I was doomed to be. You are a college graduate. Yes. And that was unusual for boys in that home oh, to yes. go to college. Mm -hmm. And there was a link to your family on mm -hmm. that college. Uh, they had a scholarship. How did you incorporate that into this life that has now become your reality? Um, I didn't really want to go to, to Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, because I was from Illinois. But at the same time, it was the only place I had money to go, because there weren't at that time scholarships. True story, I applied for federal aid at college and they denied me. How could that be? They said, well, if you're living on your own, then you must be self-sufficient. Well, I'm a kid from an orphanage. I have all people qualify. And they're like, well, not according to the government rules. Now they have changed that. Yeah, sure. But I was like, oh, great, just one more step against me. But uh, there was a Mitchell Family Scholarship. And once I got there, I learned I could, could just be Rob instead of Robbie from the orphanage, which helped. Now, you were one of the last boys to go all the way to age 18 right. in this home, and they called you a lifer. Right. I was the last lifer. Why not foster care? That's one of the bizarre things. Again, for kids like us, somebody owns us. System doesn't like that phrase, but it's how we see it. My mother owned me in that she had legal custody until the kidnapping and lost it in, in third grade when Uncle Arnold in Atlanta got legal custody. So I was never a ward of the state. And so the family wouldn't let me go to foster care. All right. And do we, do you resist it at all to going to foster care too? Was it almost as if you were abandoning a family that you sort of knew? By the time I was eight or nine and it was even being explored, and I didn't know all the dynamics that was going on in Atlanta at the time, uh, I had only seen the damage from foster care. The, the kids had been in five, six homes by the time they were 10. And you feel like, and we were told this, behave or they'll send you back. We were told this. 
And I finally got to the point, I said, look, I don't like living here. I'm not happy I'm going to live here all my childhood, but I know who I am here. And I will take here, and at the time I wouldn't have said it, but stunted emotional and social development because I know who I am here. I'm not happy, but I know who I am. You know a little bit more about the foster care system as it exists today. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sort of observations about whether that would have been a good idea for a child of your age at third grade to make that sort of decision today? I think, as always, the foster care system's mixed. There's some fabulous people in there uh, as adults trying to help, both on the staff side as well as foster parents. Um, but at the same time, there are people involved on the parent side that are emotional, psychological, financial, or sexual predators. Um, if I have to pick one model, which isn't fair, but if I did, I would pick a group home, not the 60 kids in an institution I grew up in, but especially for some of the older teens. There's more than half a million kids in the American social welfare system today, over 114,000 eligible to be adopted. For a lot of these kids, there's no real good family solution to go back to. And permanency, from my point of view, is more important. And permanency could actually be a group home exactly. if, it's, if it's sustained and constant. Exactly. Where you've got qualified staff 24-7 who are trained, trained to look for things, trained to respond, trained to sense things where that kid needs to be connected with someone who can handle them at a deeper level, not necessarily leave. But the other thing it does, too, is if it's, say, an all-boys group home, you don't have to explain your past to these kids. They we, get it, too. They get it, you know? They were, we never talked about our stories. We didn't want to talk about it. Everybody knew that someone had a sad story yeah. or they wouldn't be there. Exactly. So I, I do like group homes. I'm not saying that's the solution, but the, the government appears to be hostile to it. I'm not persuaded it's a philosophical decision as much as it is being financially cheap. So what do people need to flourish, uh, young men and women or boys and girls? What do they need if they're in an uh, orphan-type situation to flourish? They need mentors. They need mentors. They need mentors, men and women mentors, who will just keep showing up. You know, when I travel around the country, and I've spoken from uh, Hawaii to Budapest, Hungary, um, the people who are my heroes are the ordinary men and women who keep showing up, not the celebrities. Um, you know, the guy who will take an at-risk kid fishing once a month. Uh, the, the, the woman... Just being a regular person. Yes. Why don't mentors show up more in your estimation? Because they don't realize the impact they can have. They don't think they know enough. They don't know the words to say. They don't have anything to talk about. They're scared, maybe? They're scared, yeah. Um, and the thing is, you don't have enough words to change my life. But if you'll show up, then maybe I'll listen eventually. And maybe don't worry so much about relating to that experience. Yeah. Just be a, a loving human being exactly. to another human being. Right. And give it time. And give them opportunities, but give them boundaries. Right. Because for many of us, our, our past home life is so chaotic, we want boundaries. We won't admit to it. And we'll test them over and over again to make sure they're real. But we want boundaries because boundaries mean you care. Absolutely, because you care enough to actually uh, set a no in place yeah. because you want that person to be That's better. Right. You just don't want them to run ragged. That's right. You want them to be the best person they can be. That's, That's right. why a no is so important. Exactly. You, know? you also married into a family that mm -hmm. gave you a new sense of family. Yes. How important was that to your overall well-being? It was really wonderful. Um, I was petrified of being married, of repeating the past or marrying my mother. That was my great fear. Um, Susan's parents, my wife's, uh, Joe and Mary, now deceased, uh, were wonderful. My mother-in-law was truly one of my best friends. Beautiful. I'm not exaggerating that. Um, I still miss her terribly. Um, and it wasn't that she was an eloquent woman or a particularly studied or learned woman. She was just genuine. She actually just opened her heart to you, yeah. and she did not judge you, did she? No. And she was taking something that was most precious to her, which was her daughter, exactly. and saying, I'm going to entrust her with your life. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're worthy. Yes. That's a beautiful thing. And I'm not the prince to the Cinderella story. You know, most parents want their daughters to marry a good boy from a good family. Right. That's not me. You had a past That's that right. was unusual. Yeah. That's yeah. right. 
What do you think are the myths of uh, orphans today? What do you think are the things that people just don't understand? I think the first myth is that you don't have to be a child whose both parents have actually died to be an orphan. Okay. That's too narrow a definition. What's the better definition? Uh, at the risk of sounding, selling my book, they're castaway kids. Most of the kids that are in the social welfare system in America are not biological orphans. They actually have a parent. Alive somewhere. But they're not available to them. Yes. So you really think this abandonment is as devastating as actually not having alive parents. Oh yes, the, uh, the great contemporary psychologist M. Scott Peck wrote, to a child abandonment's worse than death. And we can actually do something about that by showing up, can't we? Yes. So you can be a substitute friend, maybe not a parent, but mm -hmm. a substitute person who believes in another human being. Exactly. A favorite aunt or uncle, even if there's no biological connection. Because a child does not have to be born of someone's womb to be born of their heart. Thank you, Rob. My guest today has been Rob Mitchell, author of Castaway Kid, One Man's Search for Hope and Home, which is his story of growing up in an orphanage. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.